saw it on Linden Street. Hello, and welcome to I Saw It on Linden Street, the show dedicated to the joy of finding and appreciation in cult films, exploitation oddities, beloved classics, and all points in between. I'm your host, Chris Roberts, inviting you to join us here at the Linden Street Cinema Experience Theater as we once again dig up a fun cinematic relic from the past. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for joining us. This isn't your standard film review. Rather, this is a synopsis of a film that we feel deserves to have another inspection. A little bit of background thrown in on the actors, stories about the director, and hey, if I'm doing my job, perhaps you're going to get a half amusing story out of me. So, fair be warned, while we don't cover all aspects of plot, we do discuss endings and spoilers. So, if you'd like to be surprised, please give the film a viewing before you listen to us. If you like us, and I would hope that you do, please recommend this podcast to a friend, give us a favorable review, and subscribe. So, we're wrapping up our month-long theme, That's Blame Canada, our curated selection of some of the underrated and overlooked Canuxploitation classics that are out there. This week, we close out with the fabulous Little Scene Gem, a cult classic that is 1976's The Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane. Join us! So I got a cop to this. Full disclosure. I'm not a huge Jodie Foster fan. Now, don't get me wrong. She stars in films that I like and that I own. And I'm not saying she's a bad actress or unenjoyable. But honestly, if I had to make, you know, a pick, the part of her career that I'm a fan of is almost completely the work she did as a child actress. And I think it's a better use of one's time to go back and look at her older films. And look, look, I'm not going to argue with anybody. Silence of the Lambs is a fantastic film and she is great in it. But my case in point, at least for Foster, is she did a host of work as a child actress. And a lot of it is really good. She's in the Kansas City Bomber in 1972 with Raquel Welsh. She's in the kids' musical Tom Sawyer in 73. She's in Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore in 74. Taxi Driver, Bugsy Malone, and this film, all in 76. She then follows it up with Freaky Friday. She's in Carney in 1979, and then she's in Foxes in 1980. With the exception, again, of Silence of the Lambs and Hell, because I'm nostalgic, I'll throw Maverick in there. I'm kind of good stopping with her career in, like, the mid-90s and just leaving her filmography where it is. Now, all that said, and I can feel through the ether my sister-in-law's jaw dropping, uh, I will, without any hesitation, say I will go to the mattress any time to defend the insanely wonderful film she directed. 1995's Home for the Holidays is a goddamn masterpiece. It's a future episode on this podcast for sure, and a film that is worth everybody seeing. Go see it. It's a great movie. All that said, though, this week's offering is a fantastic film of hers that a number of people out there have missed. I caught this one, like so many others I've caught, in college when I was looking for something new that was old to catch. Hmm. Weird box art? It's got Jodie Foster. (laughs) Martin Sheen's in this? What the hell? Let's try this. And thus, I found a thriller with a wicked little twist. Let's get into this week's film. So this was written by Laird Koenig, who actually, when he started, was trying to turn this story into a stage play, uh, which actually makes a lot of sense because a lot of what we have here with this film feels very much like a play. Most of the actual script takes place within like two or three rooms. There's not a ton of interaction outside. There is a little, 
but most of the conversations all take place in the living room area of Rin's home, and that it gives it a very play vibe. Here's the problem. You can't do a serious touring company of a play that uses children, actual children, to play those roles. Because if you have an engagement for any extended period of time, the unfortunate part of hiring kids is they start to grow up. So you can't have this story that is centered on the fact that they are teens and preteens. You're never going to be able to have an actor or actress that can stay with the role long term. That being said, he decided to switch gears and he pens his entire story first as a novel. Once that novel's printed, the Hungarian-born Francophile director Nicholas Gesner ended up getting his hands on it, and he fell in love with the story and immediately thought, I need to secure the rights. His only problem was those rights were already optioned by famous producer Sam Spiegel. He's done a number of works. Uh, you might have heard of some of them. The African Queen, On the Waterfront, Lawrence of Arabia. This guy was no slouch. The problem for Spiegel was he ended up having a bunch of creative differences. And over time, he left the project and left Koenig. Therefore, the property opened back up, and that is when Gesner swooped in, bought the rights, and decided he was going to make his own version of this film. Pretty cool, huh? Director Gesner ended up seeing Jodie Foster when she was filming a minor part for Martin Scorsese's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And based on just that performance, he thought she would be perfect for the role of the savvy and independent Rin. Foster's mother actually encouraged her to take the role, and because of that, we get a very interesting performance out of her. Now, for the role of the villain, Gesner reached out to an actor that he most admired, one Martin Sheen. In a 2015 interview, Sheen himself shared that he was initially convinced to take the role by director Gesner, which is actually quite interesting. Sheen himself loved the novel, and when he read the screenplay, he thought this was going to be amazing. What he floored the director with, however, was his initial request to play the romantic foil, the role of the magician friend who would become the love interest for the teenaged little girl. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying Sheen is a bad actor, because he isn't. He's amazing. But for the time this film was in pre-production, Sheen himself was 36 years old. He had a daughter who was almost Foster's age, 13. In what universe did he think he was going to be able to pull off playing a teen love interest? Thankfully, Gesner ended up steering him in the direction of playing the role of Frank Hallett, the menacing child molester who keeps trying to intrude upon Rin's independence and victimize her. For the role of Mrs. Hallett, Canadian actress Alexis Smith was cast both to bring her years of stage and theater chops to the fore and, quite frankly, to make sure that enough of the actors on the film fit in with the two-thirds cast crew rule implemented by the Canadian government to qualify for a tax credit. Still, she's a solid actress and her subtle touches and her resolve equally make her pushy habits a direct threat to Foster's Rin. The great comedian and songwriter Mort Shulman was cast as Officer Migloridi. You may know him, well, let me rephrase, you may not know him, but you've certainly heard his work. With co-writing credits on songs like Teenager in Love, This Magic Moment, Save the Last Dance for Me, and Viva Las Vegas, Shulman has had a long influence on entertainment. 
He's wonderful here as the kindly police officer who is genuinely worried about Rin and is uncle to the awkward Mario. Incidentally, he ended up serving as the musical supervisor for this picture. Last but not least, since we just mentioned him, we have Chicago's own a young Scott Jacoby in the role of the budding magician and love interest for Rin, Mario. It's a solid role for Jacoby, but by no means is his first. He had five films under his belt and had previously worked with Sean Connery in the Anderson tapes back in 71. He was with Robert Klein in 72 with the film Rivals. Perhaps, if you're familiar with his work, uh, he is the titular boogeyman character in the made-for-TV film Bad Ronald that came out in 1974. Great movie, Dabney Coleman, Kim Hunter. Go see it. People like my wife would recognize him more from the sitcom The Golden Girls, where he had a reoccurring role playing B. Arthur's character, Dorothy's Boranax adult son, Michael, on several episodes. But either way, Scott Jacoby, good egg, excellent here. Now, I gotta say, for those who've seen it and remember this film, there's only two things that people familiar with it really hone in on. First, Martin Sheen's intensity as a slimy pedophile. And, such as in the case of my wife, B, the scene that breaks most people's resolve for this film. The death of Rin's hamster at the hands of Sheen's Frank Hallett. For the making of the film, no real hamster was actually harmed. A frozen hamster corpse was obtained from an animal hospital, long since naturally dead. So all of the struggling was Sheen acting as if he's holding a live hamster, and the squeaks added in were all sound effects. Thus, the throwing of a dead animal into a fireplace is not as horrifying in real life as it is on screen. Still, it's a scene that turns a lot of people off, and when we watch the film together, my wife always asks me to skip the scene. <sighs> Filming was done in Montreal, which was odd because it's substituting so hard in for Maine, which I honestly find interesting. This is a story that doesn't actually need to have any, quote, real location. In fact, you don't really even need to know where it takes place. It's just a small town, and it can be anywhere as far as storytelling purposes go. So, trying to, like, say we're in Maine, we're not really in Canada, that's just, it's silly to me. It doesn't matter. It's a good story regardless. Now, cast and crew did enjoy themselves. Sheen noted that filming in Montreal was very cold, but everything seemed to get along fine until this next point. Something to discuss, this is a PG film, and it's both subdued and yet equally intense. Save for mostly off-screen hamster trauma, all the violence in the film is just implied, but the intensity comes from the real ever-present threat of physical assault and dread. And that's where all that intensity and horror comes from, Frank Hallett's character. But this is pre-1984 PG, which falls into the category of fair game when it comes to the outright bizarre inclusion of either violence or nudity. And in this case, it's going to be nudity. You see, for some inexplicable reason, one of the producers felt that this film needed to have a love scene between the two teens, uh, at least with implied nudity. And what's more confusing, on the part of a 13-year-old Foster. Naturally, and well within her rights, Foster walked off the set, arguing she's not going to do that. And, hey, I'd love to throw at you, this was a different time... You know, people expected different things out of entertainment, but no, this is a total head-scratcher for me. What the hell were they thinking? This problem, which again was of their own making, was solved by actually having Foster's 21-year-old sister 
stand in as a body double for the 13 year old sparing the youth of having to appear naked on film and now oddly giving the impression that a minor did in fact just have a nude scene filmed it adds nothing to the story It's just a transitionary shot of people getting dressed, and all it does is make me think that the producers are bigger fans of Frank Hallett than we might have first thought. It's strange, it's bizarre, it doesn't really fit with the rest of this film, and it kind of throws the tone into a different place. Which, I have to say, maybe also adds to just the strange icky feeling this entire film gives you, putting you on edge and hoping for the best of our young characters. Well, anyway, I've talked enough. How about we get to that trailer? They called her the little girl who lives down the lane. All alone in that big house. Who was she? And what was her secret? A lot of people wondered. Like Mario, the local comedian. Somebody's out there. Officer Miglioretti, the local cop. I don't believe what you've been telling me about your father. You're a very pretty girl, you know that? Pretty eyes. Frank Hallett, the local creep. And nasty Mrs. Hallett, the local gossip. Mrs. Hallett, I'm warning you! I want to know what's been happening here in this house. I want to know what happened here today! I think I should warn you that the police are watching our house right this very minute, Mr. Hallett. Aren't you scared? Of what? Of being alone. No one will know about us. I never knew how much I needed you. Now listen to me, young lady. I know you're up to something. Go in that study, Mrs. Hallett, and I tell my father about your son. I even had to ask him why the police don't do anything about it. Why should they do anything? When your son gives candy to pretty little girls. Academy Award nominee Jodie Foster, Martin Sheen, Alexis Smith. girl who lives down the lane. Trick or treat! What? Trick or treat! It's Halloween, young lady. Why aren't you out trick or treating? Oh, somebody's birthday. Who is yours? Well, happy birthday. Thank you. And besides your birthday, tonight's also Halloween. Can I tell my father what you want? My name's Frank Howard. Your father knows me. My two kids will be along any minute. They're trick-or-treating. I'm just going along to make sure there aren't any uh, wheel goblins hanging around. Like dirty old men who try to give pretty little girls some candy. <laughs> tell your father you've got company. You better shut the door or you let all the heat out of the house. Now, I've seen you around, but we've never met, have we? Yeah, you just came over from England, right? Right. And they don't celebrate Halloween in England? Oh, it's a big day here when all the kids get dressed up in scary costumes and masks and go around all the houses. And when you answer the door, they shout trick or treat, and you're supposed to act scared. And if you don't give them a treat, well, they pull some dirty trick on you. You mean to tell me no trick or treaters have been by here tonight? Well, there will be. My two kids will be along here any minute. One's a green skeleton, the other's a Frankenstein monster. <laughs> What's considered a treat? Oh, candy, popcorn, gum, anything like that. Would you like a piece of cake? But that's your birthday cake. Shouldn't cut it just for them. Probably. Where's your mother? My mother's dead. Your father's here. Smokes French cigarettes, right? Am I right about the French cigarettes? Yeah. Where is he upstairs? Your father's upstairs. Oh, he's in a study working. Oh, yes. He's a poet. My mother says he's a poet. Whatever my mother says automatically ought to be true. Wouldn't dare not be. My mother's a real estate lady that leased this place to you and your father. Oh, that's great. Kids are going to love this. Oh, 
Are my hands cold? You're 13? I counted 13 candles. That's all I had. You're 14? I'll bet you write poetry, too. I'd like to read your poems sometime. Just you and your father live here? Just you two? Yeah. And uh, I'll bet this is his favorite chair, isn't it? Yeah. What have you got there? What is that, a hamster? Oh, let me see. Oh, I just want to see. What's his name? He's got to have a name. Tell me his name. Gordon. Gordon? He's cute. Shouldn't you tell your father I'm here? No, not when he's working. You're a very pretty girl, you know that? Pretty eyes. Pretty hair. Pretty girl like you and your birthday and all. No boyfriend? Come on, I'll bet you got a boyfriend. I bet you got lots of boyfriends. Pretty girl like you. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's all right. Relax. I get the spank you on your birthday. That's the custom. Right. <laughs> yes, you get one spank for every year and one to grow on. See, you got off easy. Oh, don't get mad. It's just a game. It's just a silly birthday game. That's all. You don't think I'm just trying to be fresh, do you? <laughs> don't be silly. Now I've got two kids of my own, you know. I'm going to be along here any minute. Ah, here they come now, you. Well, I'm off. <laughs> Thank you for the treats. <laughs> no uh, trick on you tonight, right? Hello, boys. Hey, your father. I'm sorry I missed you. Good night. Hey, I've got some treats for you. Here we go. One to go. That one to go. Come on, boys. Let's go. Happy birthday! Come on, boys. Let's go. Young Rin Jacobs, as played by Foster, is celebrating her 13th birthday alone in her and her father's home. The Jacobs have just moved recently back from England, and they have leased the house for several years. And Rin is just getting settled, trying to make the most of what is going to be her time spent here. A strange knock at the door and the arrival of a very persistent, very, let's say, manic Frank Hallett, as played by Martin Sheen, sets a bad tone for the rest of her evening. Unfortunately, the next day finds Frank watching Rin's house from afar in his car as she goes about her business, running errands at the bank and purchasing groceries. Rin is actually visited that afternoon by Mrs. Hallett, Frank's mother, and her and her father's landlady. The conversation starts out rather cordial, but when Rin isn't willing to put up with Mrs. Hallett's veiled threats and demands, the flummoxed woman leaves, vowing to return to get her precious jelly jars from the cellar and demanding to be able to speak with Rin's father. How are you two getting along out here? Everything all right? Yes, it's fine. You do remember me. I'm Cora Hallett. Your father leased this house from me. Yeah, I remember you. Where'd this come from? It's my father's. This belongs here. That table and braided rug belong over there. Poets aren't supposed to live like other people, is that it? I keep forgetting to ask him to autograph one for me. I love you, sign father. Nice and simple. We don't see much of you two in the village. Not even at the market. Well, the market does deliver. <laughs> if one can afford it. Do you want me to give a message to my father? Such a shame about those grapes. Nobody bothered to spray. I can give my father any message. I came for the jelly glasses. For as long as I can remember, the owners and I have made jelly out of those grapes. The glasses are in the cellar. Your father's not home? No, he isn't. Oh, that's too bad. I was having a little gathering at my house, and I was hoping that, uh... Is he in the village? No, he's in New York. When I was outside, I could have sworn I heard voices. Hebrew. <laughs> I should think French would be more help. Or Italian. Lord knows there are enough of them around these days to speak it with. 
sure you don't want to give my father a message. So many outsiders in the village these days. Hmm, from London. Yeah. I do a crossroads. Well, you can take it with you if you like. But your father's doing it. I'm doing it. And he will. My son's children tell me you gave them some birthday cake the other night. He came inside the house? My son? Yeah, he came inside. Your father? Your father was here that evening? He was in a study. He's working. He can't be disturbed. Since that evening, my son's been back? No. Not been back at all? No. If my son should come back and your father isn't here, it might be better if you didn't let him in. Well, he didn't ask my permission the first time. I hope you didn't intend that to sound so rude. I'll tell my father you said not to let your son inside the door. That won't be necessary. Maybe I don't understand what you want, Mrs. Hallett. One thing I certainly do not want is to go on and on about something that doesn't matter in the slightest. I came for jelly glasses. We'll get them now. Your son says I have pretty hair. Did he tell you that? Huh? We'll get the glasses now. Here in the cellar. We'll uh, move this table so I can get the rug up and raise the trap door. My father and I like the table where it is. But the glasses are in the cellar. I'll get them for you later, Mrs. Hallett. Move the table. This is my house. You are an extraordinarily rude little girl who's going to do exactly as I say. Last week you took the only good grapes we have and now the crab apples. And you never asked if you might. And today you just walked bang into my house. This is not your house. My house. Least. You're 13. Why aren't you in school? 13 means I have no rights, is that it? 13 means you should be in school. Look at me when I speak to you. I study at home. So it happens I'm a member of the school board. When we meet on Monday, they'll be very interested in your case. Now, where's your father? I told you he's in New York. Exactly where in New York? He's having lunch with his publisher. I want the publisher's telephone number. I don't have it. The publisher's name? So it's London. Your father will telephone me the moment he comes back. Is that understood? Unfortunately for Rin, Mrs. Hallett does come back. And the two get into, oh, somewhat of a shouting match over whether or not she has the right to come and claim her precious jelly jars. Mrs. Hallett forces her way in and slaps Rin when Rin mocks the fact that her son has an unhealthy interest in young girls. Mrs. Hallett then goes down into the cellar, despite Rin's pleas. And whatever she sees there frightens her so much, she lets out a blood-curdling scream. In her attempts to come up the stairs, Mrs. Hallett trips the cellar door support and strikes her own head with the crashing of the hinge knocking herself down the cellar steps, dropping her dead. Rin tries to get rid of Mrs. Hallett's car, but she's unable to start the vehicle. Her actions end up alerting a young man by the name of Mario, as played by Jacoby. He's this nerdy but affable magic enthusiast walking with a pronounced limp. Not asking anything from her in return, he does agree to come back and help her move the car. And he ends up having a pleasant dinner with Rin, where they get to know one another. And they actually do click. You see, Mario is able to point out the flaws in Rin's thinking. And Rin actually is treating Mario not as some weirdo who does magic tricks, but as an equal who is worthy of attention. It's a really good start to a great relationship. Hey, Mario. Thanks about the car and stuff. You know, you may be smart, but you're stupid. I mean, if you really wanted to get her car away from the front of the house, why go to all the hassle of taking it down to the station? You see, the trick in magic is to do the one thing so simple and so obvious that no one ever thinks of it. Now, you see, what's simpler than putting the car back where it came from? Did anyone see you take her car back to her office? Jesus, you think I want to get busted for ripping off old lady Hallett's most prized possession? You know, you don't even trust me enough to tell me why I did it. You did it to help me? Did you lock her car doors? You should have put them through her office mailbox. No, I shouldn't. Let me tell you, 
I'm sitting there in her Bentley in the dark, right? In front of her goddamn office, trying not to let anybody see me and ask me what I'm doing. I gotta be careful, right? Now, I may not know why Mrs. Hallett didn't drive her own car back, but one thing I do know. Why would Mrs. Hallett put her own keys through her own goddamn office mailbox? She wouldn't. She'd keep her keys. They'd be wherever she is. I feel like some wine. Hey, now, this is pretty fancy. It doesn't even unscrew. It's got a cork and everything. Now, this is class. You still didn't tell me why. How come she didn't drive her own car back? So what do you care? Yeah, I risked my goddamn ass for you. You didn't have to. You better tell me what the hell's going on, because if I had left that car down at the station like you told me to, everybody in the village would have recognized it. You don't trust anybody, do you? You want another lamb chop? Should we save it for your father? Oh, he's staying overnight in New York. Yeah, he never said that. Have you ever stayed alone before? Sure, hundreds of times. Like all those times you smoked hash? <laughs> Aren't you scared? Of what? Of being alone. You know, last week on TV, I saw this old woman who was strangled with a body stocking. <laughs> I mean, it can happen. You know you got an outside light. Leave it on all the time, okay? Thanks. You know, with me, you got an indoor light. Hey, that's neat. Well, Mr. Showbiz, that's me. Mario's uncle, Officer Migliorini, is played by... Schumann stops by to check up on Rin and mentions to the two of them that he would really like to speak with Rin's father. You see, Mr. Hallett has put out a missing persons report about his mother, and she had previously mentioned that she would be planning on stopping by Rin's place that afternoon, and she's subsequently gone missing. Mario ends up helping Rin cover, claiming that Mr. Jacobs is upstairs sleeping and he throws his uncle off the scent. Before the two of them can breathe a sigh of relief, however, Frank Hallett shows up in person and begins to violently throw his weight around, demanding to know where his mother is, trying to scare the youths into giving him what he wants, killing Rin's beloved hamster in the process. After ignoring Shoving around and writing Mario off as an infirmed teen, Frank is quickly chased out of the house by the youth, who reveals that the cane he carries also houses a sword blade. Now, knowing she can fully trust him, Rin ends up opening up to Mario about her entire situation. Rin ends up sharing her plight. Her father was terminally ill and killed himself in the ocean. He left Rin instructions on how to take care of herself and on what she should do if other adults start coming around. Adults like her mother, who was wanting her father's money and came calling. Rin took the potassium cyanide that her father left her and drugged and killed her mother when she came months prior looking for both her and money. It was her corpse that was embalmed in the cellar, her corpse that Mrs. Hallett uncovered when she went for her jelly jars and thus scared her into her own self-inflicted death. Understanding and sympathetic to her cause, Mario ends up helping Rin bury both her mother and Mrs. Hallett's body in the garden, digging their graves during a thunderous downpour. Three years of my life here. 
The rent's paid up for the next three years. So three more years like this? Almost all September, uh... He looks fine. The pain was terrible. He never said anything. And, uh, one Sunday evening, we were sitting in this room. And he whispered to me in a very soft voice that uh, I wasn't like anybody else in the world. That people wouldn't understand me. They'd uh, order me around, tell me what to do, and try to make me into the person they wanted me to be. Since I was only a kid say anything. I'd have to stay alone, keep out of trouble, and make myself very small in the world. All alone? We worked out every detail. We knew it wouldn't be easy. There's a letter from my father. Don't give in and play their game. Fight them any way you have to. Survive. kissed me and walked off into the trees and down the lane. In that room, I found charts of tide tables and waters and the sound in the ocean. I'll never be found. Did you cry a lot? Depends what you mean by a lot. No. I guess not very much. You believe in God? It'd be nice. But you don't. I don't know. You know, it's all so goddamn wild. I mean, there's so many problems. How do you pay for stuff? Traveler's checks. Yeah, kids can have them, too. I keep them in a safe deposit box in the bank. I have to make them last for three years. How'd your mother find you? By lying to my father's publisher. She walked right in. Fingernails as red as ever. My God, the nerve of her. She sat right over there. Smoked her gold-tipped cigarettes on and on about the pollution in the Mediterranean and how marvelous it would be to stay here. I hated myself for doing it, but I actually acted happy to see her. She asked me for a drink. But I lied and told her we didn't have any. I gave her some tea with the same almond biscuits. They're very good. My father had given me a small bottle containing some white powder. He said if she should arrive, I should put it in her tea. It calm her, make her less aggressive. Well, it sure did. But you didn't know what it was. No, not until after. I looked it up based on its properties. Potassium cyanide. And that's what you put in your tea? I don't remember what he said about doing anything you have to survive. How come you're not drinking yours? Mine's still too hot. I didn't put in any cold milk. I can still see her red nails holding up that cup. After a few sips, she said that the tea tasted of almonds. <coughs> it's the almond cookies, I told her. They come from Fortnum's. She loved that. How long did it take? Quite fast, actually. <coughs> you mean like first you can't breathe? Yeah, apparently. You see, though, Mario's uncle, Officer Migliorini, comes by yet again, asking to speak to Rin's father, doubtful of what Rin has told him before. He is pleasantly surprised, however, to see Mr. Jacobs descend from the upstairs in the flesh, coming down to talk to the officer to clear up any of these questions the lawman might have, and what's more, to sign an autographed copy of his poetry to him. After he takes his leave, it is revealed that it was just Mario the entire time, wearing elaborate makeup and prosthetics from his magician's kit, saving Rin yet again and keeping her secret safe. The two end up sharing the night together, but in the following days it is revealed that Mario has taken ill from all of the time he spent in the steady rain, helping Rin cover her tracks. It appears Mario has been hospitalized with pneumonia, and Rin is yet again left all alone in the house. Alone. That is, until she hears noises coming from downstairs, and she is horrified to see mud tracks on her floor and see a dark figure rising out of the cellar. And it turns out to be none other than her arch-nemesis at this point, Mr. Frank Hallett. You know, 
There's no reason you shouldn't go right on living the way you have been. Only now, of course, we'll be friends, you and I. Just us two, huh? We could become very good friends. I like the way you handled yourself on the phone. You are brilliant. Are you better and resourceful? Very cool under fire. You know how to survive, don't you? as I take Nothing like a nice hot cup of tea, is it? No. Something wrong, my dear? No. Why aren't you drinking your tea? I'm waiting for you. You're the guest. Do you put more milk in your... Did I? Actually, that's the way I prefer mine. I prefer yours. Look at me when I talk to you. I want yours. It gives us more feeling of sharing, don't you agree? Ladies first. Switch cups, don't you? No. Oh, no. Think. <clears throat> Some sort of test? Uh-huh. Just so you remember, none of your little tricks. <coughs> Tea tastes like almonds. Must be the almond cookies. You see, Frank has come by, claiming to have figured it all out, and he knows Rin has murdered his mother, although he can't put his finger on it, and he decides he's going to blackmail the teen, deciding that this is the time he's going to make the power play of explaining to them that he's going to keep her secrets in exchange for sexual favors. Rin is dejected and thinking she has lost decides to okay give over to frank's demands but not before making tea for the two of them where she has mixed an ample amount of potassium cyanide for herself to take during this tea party it's only when frank not trusting her takes her tea instead and while eating the almond cookies, expresses his concern that this tea tastes a little funny. Rin, smiling at him, knowing that she is now going to be safe, explains to him, it's just the cookies. No need to worry. And thus, 
all of the problems Rin is facing tie themselves together in a nice neat little bow. The credits roll as Frank coughs in the background, trying to explain to Rin his plans for their future. For starters, where do we even begin? First, the concept that really strikes me about this film is, hey, it's set in 1976, just how many people give Rin a hard time for operating within the world in general? I mean, she's young, don't get me wrong, but man, she's questioned by adults over everything, from trying to buy groceries for herself to taking money out of her bank account. You know, I've been in and interacted with small town folks before, and while I can't exactly say, yeah, they've been friendly with outsiders, I'm looking at you, Rib Lake, Wisconsin. They are not completely blind to people wanting to spend their hard-earned money on... Oh, wait, no. I'm totally wrong. That's exactly how fucking backwards small towns are. They actively work against their own interest in crafting artisanal xenophobia that they meet out upon others. Gotcha. This film actually snaps into focus and makes total sense. When I look through the film and that lens, this is a bold exercise in child emancipation rights, both from the perceived familial obligations to society at large. Rin is not so much afraid that people will find out that her family is dead per se, that's at least explainable. What she doesn't want is her lost autonomy. She is looking to buy some time just to navigate the next five years until it is ultimately recognized that she is a legal adult and she can fully come out of hiding. For me, the film gets it right. Noticeably, even the characters that are sympathetic to her, such as Officer Migliatori, they don't really listen to her and what she is saying, thus writing her off as just a kid, which is indeed a powerful message and perhaps one that society should value. You know, just taking into account young people's input a little bit more. Everybody here is absolutely great, but Sheen, I mean, not to beat a dead horse, but goddamn, he's a monster. The concept that his shoes are permanently muddy in this film because he is always lurking outside of people's windows, my god, that's a great touch. His forced attempts at being friendly, his weird, creepy chuckles that only go, you know so far with him damn Sheen himself has gone on record to point out that to this day he's still getting letters from people angry at him that he quote killed that hamster on screen but he himself is very pleased with the ending of the film Sheen points out that one of the things that makes him so happy is Frank gets his comeuppance but it happens off screen the audience, they know what's happening, and they refer to it. And Sheen has stated it's titillating. It lets the audience and the viewers know the gravity of the moment. They know there's both a good outcome that is coming forward. It's a fantastic zig when you feel the film is about to zag, and it leaves one knowing that they can be thankful the character of Rin is safe and you can continue rooting for her. She's going to go on and maintain her independence and safety and she's not going to have a man like Frank chasing after her anymore. Not to be outdone, I have to give props where props are due, Alexis Smith Mrs. Hallett, in her subtle way with her attempts to bully and browbeat Rin, are fantastic. It starts slow, her pushing those boundaries, 
moving around and manipulating the furniture, what she feels she can do as the landlady, demanding to get access to the cellar where she has stored personal items even though she, quote, shouldn't have. Her subtle threats and inquiries as to where Rin should be and to where her father is, then focusing on those, quote, stored personal items, those just chef's kiss make this all the better as she walks through Rin's home moving furniture and manipulating items as if they were hers she is clearly laying claim to her territory this is a power struggle it's both subtle and out in the open and it's oh so well done by Smith you don't initially get to see the intensity ratcheting up until it's already hit a boiling point and then at that point Rin doesn't yield her home to this demanding busybody and then after that it's an all-out war for dominance and the actress Smith nails it oh so well I was just about to put a kettle on would you uh, like some tea very interested in your case you don't want to hear what they said. As for tea, Darjeeling or Earl Grey? I came here prepared to forget about yesterday, but I must say I don't care for your tone any better today. Well, then it's up to me to apologize. What I find particularly surprising is that most boys and girls who are educated in England are so well behaved. What did you decide for the tea? Not a glass of that thick, sweet wine you people use in your religious rituals. Or aren't you old enough to drink wine? You told my son 14, you told me 13 now. Which is it to be? 13. And brilliant. As so many of your people are. Mrs. Hallett, will you please accept my apology for what happened yesterday? I'm afraid it isn't that simple. You told my son your father wished to speak to me? I certainly wish to speak to him. Call him. Well, he's translating right now. I couldn't disturb him even for Officer Migliori. Officer Migliori works for people like me. In case you're wondering, I'm waiting right here until you do call your father. You never answered about the tea. For the life of me, I can't imagine what made any of us think you could be happy here. My father and I love this house. No, I think we'll make other plans. Our lease is for three years. Leases have been known to be broken. Unless, of course, your father and I could come to some understanding. And what would that be, Mrs. Howell? There it is again, that continual mocking tone. And don't look at me with those hurt eyes and pretend you've been misunderstood. You and I both know you say exactly what you intend. Here your glasses, Mrs. Holland. I'm being dismissed. Call your father. Right this minute. Not when he's working. You and I know perfectly well he isn't there. Go in that study, Mrs. Hallett, and I tell my father about your son. My son? About Halloween. I haven't told my father yet. Told your father what? What happened here? Apparently everybody in the village knows about your son. Migliori. He's a liar. He hates my son. Did he tell you he had an affair with my son's wife before they were married? I even had to ask him why the police don't do anything about it. Why should they do anything? When your son gives candy to pretty little girls. Did you have the glasses, Mrs. Howard? You are going to get out of this house. My house? With or without your father? Sure, this is a lonely place. Often I'm alone. That doesn't worry me, Mrs. Howell. If it worries you, that's a problem you'd better take up with your son. God damn you. So how was this film actually received? Tepidly is the best way I could describe it. Critics were not overly harsh, but nobody was actually singing its praises either. Oddly, Many of the reviewers kept talking about the, quote, murder plot, making the film sound far more salacious and violent than it really was. Unbelievable. Yet, two things were abundantly clear. Sheen was himself chilling in his performance, and the story itself, the sweet romance between Foster and Jacoby, was well worth seeing for this film. Still, 
While I don't have the box office numbers to share at this point, the film I can at least say quickly was withdrawn from theaters and moved on to becoming a cult classic on VHS over the coming years. Over time, it has still aged well, still being a riveting thriller, and those of which who have not seen it, it, it's a master class in just building tension, and I must say it has gained approval and support from the next generation of film critics. The version of The Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane that was screened here at the LSCE was the 2016 Kino Lorber Blu-ray release. This print looks excellent, and it comes fully loaded with interviews, first from Sheen, plus a conversation between Sheen and director Gresner, full audio commentary from Gresner himself, and an original film trailer with cool new artwork. This all could be yours for the low, low price of $19.99 on Amazon.com, and I would argue it is all well worth the price. Now remember folks, we don't get anything here at the LSCE for suggesting that you particularly buy a film from any one select distributor. We just think it's important that you continue to support physical media and that to do so, these companies who own the rights to these great works will continue then to release the content that we all know and love. And hey, at the end of the day, isn't that all that really matters? Besides, this is a marvelously crafted film, and it should be seen by people. Good people, like yourselves. So, hey, what are you waiting for? Go out, get a copy today. So that's going to wrap things up here for this episode of I Saw It on Linden Street. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like us, please give us a favorable review on Apple Podcast. Swing by, check out our website, lscep.com, where we have articles, episode links, comics, all for you to peruse. We're also featured on Podchaser. That's a podcast database for listeners and creators of podcasts alike. Find us there. Give us a follow and a review if you could, please. The more reviews we get make us more searchable and findable for other people, so you are spreading the good word and supporting this show, and we ever so much appreciate it. As always, if you'd like to get in touch with us, make a comment, ask a question, send us wonderful things, please email us at lindenstreetcinemaexperience at gmail.com. If you'd like to be even more personal or wish to contribute a segment to the sidecar, please by all means, send us an audio message by way of Anchor. That's a free and easy app to use. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead. That being said, until next time, take care out there, wash your hands, stay healthy, and please remember, life's too short not to live in the past. Take it easy out there, everybody. Thank you.